How are you, my friend? Yeah, well, better, I guess. <laughs> yeah. It's been a it's been a trying week for me. For uh, it was really weird circumstance that I emailed you about there. The, my publisher Lulu, they emailed me at like midnight, like five days ago or whatever it was, and they're like uh, just this tiny paragraph not really saying anything except that they banned my entire account and all my books I've been with them for 15 years uh you know eight books and they're just like due to a, a regular internal investigation we found something that went against our lulu membership policy uh and they said it was on the new book on flat earth faq and, and so we've removed all your books and banned your account like what <laughs> I emailed them back within 10 minutes and I was like, um, could you please tell me what it is that, you know, your investigation found and uh, um, why can't I just remedy whatever the thing is in the new book? Why did you have to ban all of my books? You know, and didn't hear back from them for another 24 hours. And during that whole time, I, I messaged you thinking I wasn't going to be able to do this interview because I was spending all my time looking for new publishers trying to figure oh, out no. I, yeah <laughs> figure out what I was gonna do I um, I didn't eat and uh, I just decided to go on a fast so uh, since then it's been like five days now I haven't I haven't eaten <laughs> you might be able to see it in my, nice. that, my that's face a, long a little one. bit it's, uh, yeah I fast but, all the time so yeah I'm taking advantage of it basically at that time I just couldn't eat so I just drank water and I brought these here to. <laughs> you ever used it, either of these? Uh, is that a neti pot? A neti pot and an uh, enema bag. Oh, nice. What do you do? Like a coffee enema? No, water. Oh, nice. Just warm water. Same with, with this. And so, like, water, it's like the, the ultimate solvent. Um, but most people don't give themselves a chance to cleanse themselves if you're right. always putting in food three times yep. a day or whatever. Yep. So if you stop doing that, but then just drink water for at least 24 hours or, you know, more, more is better. Um, I'm going to do probably seven days. And while you're doing that, putting the water down the gullet, you can put it right up the other end as well. Yeah. And uh, it removes a whole bunch of impacted feces. Like people, you have like pounds of oh, yeah, for sure. stuff like, yeah, it's in there. And um, if, if you've never used a enema bag or never done a colon cleanse in your life, like you'll be surprised. The first time is the, the best. Um, yeah, yeah. You'll be surprised at what, what comes out and you'll be happy that it's out of you rather than in you. And, and uh, yeah, you'll just be shocked that um, the odor and the look, the density oh, yeah. of some of the stuff that comes out. It's like, what? that's not normal stuff. That's a new yeah. kind of stuff that's clearly been up there longer than it should have and yep. so it's kind of a baptism by water um doing that and then the the neti pot is is another one. i do this all the time anyways this is a regular yoga technique for cleaning out your sinuses and all the cranial Same. cavities behind your eyes and your ears and everything yeah put salt water in there chug it in your nose and then let, let it out uh one nostril and then yep. do the same thing out the other one and um, i do that almost every day anyway but those three modalities of using water to cleanse yourself, like the body heals itself. Yep. You don't need to take medicines and chemotherapy and radiation and all these modern allopathic medicines. Um, those are just emergency things that are best yep. used in emergency situa situations. For actual like chronic and degenerative illnesses or regular ailments, the body takes care of itself. All you got to do is get out of its way, stop eating all the time so you use all that energy digesting yep and allow yourself to just bathe oh, that's the other thing actual bathing so while you're drinking the water shooting the water up the other side putting it in your nostrils also bathe yep just you know yeah you're, you'll absorb it for sure i mean i remember being you know young and partying super hard and some mornings not even be able to stomach water after a, you know a long night of being a degenerate but a shower always helped and it seemed to hydrate you know i've always 
figured that anyways. Uh, yeah, the neti pot is great, dude, for sure, too. And I mean, we're mostly water. And I think most of society is probably drastically under hydrated, you know, and when they are drinking water, they drink like, you know, Gatorade and or they're drinking iced tea from a it's got electrolytes. Bottle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's what it's what humans crave. <laughs> electrolytes. I assume yeah, you've seen Idiocracy. Otherwise, that doesn't make sense. Yes, that, <laughs> that movie's pretty good. For as yeah. much as I hate Hollywood and everyone involved, that movie is pretty yeah. awesome. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, prophetic, almost. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Maybe it's, uh, you know, I kind of had a conversation with a friend recently, and we were talking about, like, you know, just the state of the world. And I kind of thought maybe there was some sort of, like, you know, quantum mechanics at work with this whole just society, the whole situation we're in, maybe with like books like 1984, Brave New World, you know, et cetera, where the collective consciousness absorbing that and imagining it sort of like how they play like, you know, mass shooter on TV. If they play it enough times and it reaches the masses enough, certainly that has to have a, you know, a, an right. effect on the outside world for sure. I've, I've kind of thought that about the Bible as well. And like the book of revelations where it seems like a big psyop to get, the whole world to manifest their doom and not only manifest it, but welcome it and think I'm being saved mm, going right. back up to Jesus. Right. It, it, it's like a, um, it's proving what they believed anyway. So if, if they right. write it like a playbook and then bring it into reality, all of the believers watch it coming into reality. And then rather than stopping it, they basically welcome it because it's verification of their belief. Yep. And there's like, see, see, I've been telling yep. you this was going to happen. And so, yeah, they basically, it's like a lesser magic. They're involved in, in the ritual with them by doing it that way. Yeah, yeah I'm right. not sure how much of an impact, but I would imagine, you know, it, it, it probably there's, has some, to some degree, there, it's happening. For sure. There's Just like if you surround yourself with positivity enough, you know, and you're only reading positive things and thinking about that and looking for it out in the world that's what you'll find you know and what will come around you for sure right, right. yep so uh as for lulu anyway they, they did uh, get back to me and they got back to me with an even shorter message they're like so upon re-reviewing we found that we were in error and we reinstated all of your books and so they didn't they so I was kind of happy. Well, I mean, that's good, I guess. Right, but, right. But again, no, they still didn't tell me what the whole thing was. So I, I wrote them back again. Oh, and the other part was, what, for the 24 hours that uh, I was banned, uh, I got like orders, like people who, who ordered books, I got them um, canceled or whatever. And then they unpublished all of my projects. So all my paperbacks, EPUBs, and PDFs got put in an unpublished state, which removes them from global distribution, they call it, worldwide distribution. Uh, and then when they reinstated my account, they're like, oh, you, you'll just have to republish all your your projects now. <laughs> okay. So, so I've been spending these time now trying to get, because now it, some of the pro projects don't republish. And they're like, like one of the just the design features on Lulu or screwing up one thing and like the copyright feature is claiming there's a problem, but there isn't. And so I had to like, it's just a bunch of stupid busy work that I shouldn't have to do. None of this yeah. was was my fault. So like I went through like 24 hours of, of, think, of like devastation thinking my life's work is gone. And it can be, this is, this is the yep. nature of the world we live in, you know, like totally. I, I, it's called self-publishing, but it's not really, you know, it's a company, obviously. Right. And, and, and I can't do unless I'm going to literally manufacture and have a, a, a printing press, a binder, so obviously I need to work with other people, but um, it's just really discouraging how like that and for no reason and with no explanation, they can just be like, Oh, bye bye to your life's work, Eric. Oh, but you can have it back too, actually. Oh yeah, whoops, we were wrong. I don't know what we were wrong about. We still won't tell you. Even after, so, even after I emailed them again, trying to get, so like, what was the the thing that they're just like, 
oh, it, it was an internal investigate. That's all they'll say to me. Some internal investigation, and they, you know, it, they thought one thing that was so bad they had to ban my, all my books. But then they looked into it again for, you know, 24 hours, and they're like, no, no, you're fine. Everything's fine. It's Bye-bye. odd. It would be that book too. That's the same people who the publish book. your other stuff. Yeah. So, um, you have a podcast yourself called watch the collapse is that right 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 yep yep what does what, what does that come from watch the collapse what is, where did you come sort up with of that? a play on the world trade center obviously you get wtc of course so that just seemed fitting uh and it's funny there's a album by this band from the 90s guided by voices i told you about them and uh one of their albums is do the collapse and i just happened to be like flicking through my records and saw it and just thought, man, watch the collapse. That'd be a good name for the podcast because it was right at the time me and my buddy were just starting to do it, you know, and I realized WTC and, and all that. So we just picked that name. And it's, you know, the collapse of the world and society around us. When we first started it, we were trying to be more like, you know, t- trying to disprove the mass shootings and this was a few years ago too or like a year and a half and they were still rolling out the whole thing and pushing that pretty hard so we were just trying to spread it around and uh i live across the country from most of the people i know too and like my family that i do talk to so it was a way to get that out and just to get our minds training you know start conversations so yeah um on that note and books actually there is one i didn't really like you know have any like questions for you or anything because i know you said you wanted it to be kind of informal excuse me um i just finished reading the where's the where did the towers go judy Mm. wood Mm -hmm. did you ever look into anything of her work or read that book i didn't read the book but i have seen her lectures so i'm familiar with uh, her line of reasoning behind what she says yeah Right. And uh, I mean, like, I feel like I've heard you say it, too, but that's a lot of people's first like red pill moment, you know, where they kind of realize that mainstream narratives are getting pushed at them that are uh, far from the truth or whatever. Mm. Um, what do you think about that? Do you think it seems maybe like a little bit? I Honestly, I feel like she's got like if you read that book, dude, there's mountains, mountains of evidence in it. Uh she cites all her sources. She's got tons of formulas for throwing a bowling ball off the roof at free fall speed versus, you know, the way the buildings went down and all of it. It's, it's too much to explain. And especially if you've seen her lectures, you would know most of it uh, for sure. But um, yeah, I think she's really onto something with that. And just this past few weeks reading that book, I've been deep in that little hole again. And that was one thing I was curious of what you thought about her uh, explanation. Because mm. she, she really is the only one who really provides, like, evidence and not theories at all. She doesn't really speculate on anything. Yeah. She's one of the only ones that's really picked up and run with that line of questioning of 9-11 as well. There's, for instance, other people's line of questioning runs more towards potential hologram planes, no planes theory. And then other people look at the... Um, demolition controlled thermite uh, right. in the towers theory. Um, all, all of them though, um, see, have points of evidence that make quite a bit of sense for me, all three of those. And all three of them mean that the official story is bunk. So for me, the first tier of importance when people are researching 9-11 is to just get to the point where you recognize that it couldn't possibly be the government version of events and there's some sort of internal thing going on within america uh, that allowed it to happen Uh, whether there were bombs in the buildings whether there was some kind of directed energy weapon as judy weapon uh, judy wood thinks potentially would have happened or whatever other method actually brought them down. It couldn't have been four hijacked planes and jet fuel, which is what the government is telling us. And so if you look into that, you look into that, the, how jet fuel, fuel burns, the temperatures, um, the steel beams that it's made of, the way it collapsed, how quickly it did, the free fall. 
um, it's impossible for that to have been the explanation. So then people put forward the idea of, say, um, controlled demolition through thermite, blowing out the beams floor by floor, which it does look like <clears throat> as it's going down, there's squibs going out. Yep. And so that was, you would have to remove um, the material, the floors in the way, just to have it fall at free fall speed, the way that all the towers did. Um, if it was actually just a tower collapsing on an, onto its floor like that, there would be a slight stopping, you know, or a slowing down point. I think that I've, back in the day, I saw someone did a physics model of it. It would take like 40 seconds rather than 10, because the 10 seconds is free fall collapse that the, the twin towers, um, the, the speed they took. But if, um, if you know, the floors and everything were in the way, if it was truly just due to an impact and then structural failure, as they claim, that type of collapse takes at least 40 seconds, not 10. So yep. somehow the floors were removed. Um, the original controlled demolition architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth, Alex Jones, We Are Change, etc. line of thinking was the thermite one. Then you get the, was it Simon Shack and the No Planes Forum theory, um, which that one, I guess that would potentially, the No Planes theory fits with either, because if there were no planes and it was holograms, okay, holograms don't take down buildings either, so there would still have to be a weapon mechanism that did it. So again, it would either be the thermite or the directed energy weapon or something else potentially um, but like you said um, if you look at Judy Wood's evidence it takes you know thermite sounds good you know when you that was the first bit that came out and it made perfect sense and uh, and everything but then when you look further then you find things like what she calls dustification and yeah. melt melting and so that not only have the floors and, and the material and blown up and, and collapsed and everything, it, it's been dustified, I guess, to a, a degree. Right. Where, where's, where, where's the buildings? <laughs> where, <laughs> where, the, where did they go? And also, like, cars nearby, they were melted, like the, right? Yep. Maybe you can, you can describe this better since you've just read that book. Maybe you yeah, can tell me some of the... She, there's the toasted cars, you know, and it'll be like... Here, you know, here's a twin tower with an ambulance parked right in front of it. The ambulance is magically unscathed. Those streets are covered in bits of computer office paper that none of, you know, none of it is burnt. None of it looks burnt. Uh, and then there's just anomalies of a couple cars over in the, say, the foreground while the ambulance is in the background. And half of a car will be literally toasted and melted and the other half will be perfectly fine, or some are covered in rust. Uh, there's the Hutchinson, 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 John Hutchinson effect too, that she demonstrates in there, which is essentially, um, uh, it can only happen in a static field. And I'm not sure if you know about Hurricane Aaron too, that was right offshore on 9-11 that day. Uh, yeah, early in the, or for 12 hours beforehand, and for 12 hours after, there was a hurricane that came out from the south down by Florida, came up to right off the, you know, the edge of it was right on, right off the New York shore. And apparently that creates a huge static field where, you know, it's a lot of potential energy up in the air and that works good for uh, directed energy. Apparently it's necessary to cause this Hutchinson effect. And it also was pulling uh, the wind you know, pulled all the wind out to the shore and all the smoke from that day was coming out the windows perfectly the same. So it gave you this bluebird perfect way to take pictures and videos of this tragedy rather than smoke just, you know, billowing up around it, clouding the scene potentially. But the anomaly of that is that the hurricane was down south. It came up. It stopped there 12 hours beforehand. And then 12 hours after, it magically just made a sharp right-hand turn and took off out into nowhere. And in her book, actually, it has uh, 
like satellite weather, you know, images from that, which is just super weird on its own. You know, say mm. that was a natural thing. What are the odds of that? Especially with harp and chemtrails and all these things that the government has. And we know or the government, you know, whoever the agencies are that run certain things. Um, you know, so we know it's possible for sure. It's admitted, it's patented, weather manipulation. Uh, and on top of that, nobody on any of the news stations mentioned it. A Category 3 hurricane headed mm. straight for Manhattan, you know. And they have little small Category 1s and they do like voluntary evacuations, tell people to leave the city. The city is this high off the ground, you know. It's literally at sea level. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's you know, a city on an island. So if it were to get hit by a Category 3 hurricane, it would be pretty devastating, you know, and could potentially cause a bigger loss of life than 3,000 people. You know, a big storm like that going right for Manhattan. Um, and it took right off later on that night, I think around like 8 or 9 p.m. It just took off out into the ocean, and dissipated into nothing. And the news, uh, I think there maybe was like small a very small mention of it on a news clip or two but it was super downplayed and uh i see saw a video from i think it was cbs news new york and right over uh manhattan it said like you know a little picture of a sunshine with the sunglasses and it's like beautiful day like it's gonna be great outside just mm. and it was a beautiful fall morning that day you know I was young, but I remember it, and I lived in Connecticut, and uh, it was nice up there, too. Hmm. But, yeah, that's uh, – th that's, sorry for that long tangent off onto it, but she just has loads of stuff, you know, on top of the toasted cars, the dustification, the hurricane, the Hutchinson effect, um, the seismic evidence, too, leads you to believe that if a huge 110 story building, two of them, and then seven other buildings also collapse, well, you can't see the buildings. There's no remains. They all have super anomalous, you know, holes going straight down vertically half through one of the buildings. Um, some of the outside window panes on the buildings nearby would have perfectly circular holes in them while the inside pane survived. Yeah. Lots and lots of anomalies about it. Uh, I, I, I don't know. It, it really made me like I had saw her videos before and then I read the book, you know, and really like it just pieced it all together. And I think she's really, really pretty much got it down with that because it's not a theory. You know, she's only laying out direct evidence. And the, with the things like the dustification, like you said, you know, where did those buildings go? So, I mean, she she lays out the evidence, but then she does have a theory. And the theory is that the, she would say the only um, thing that could possibly have caused this that she can think of is a directed energy weapon. And does she talk about that in the book? Like, what what would that look like? I'm curious. Is is that harp? Like, is harp capable of that, or or is this something that needs to be done from above, like an Independence Day? Alien shooting a yeah, beam in like the a tractor beam, right? Is it so? When when she says directed energy weapon, do you know what she means by that? I know that people have recreated it on small scales. Like you could do it in your bedroom if you had the right stuff. You know, just using a wall outlet. If you look up Hutchinson effect, you can see that essentially the same thing where this uh, iron, you know, will just twist and curdle and turn into nothing, but mm. just through. Uh, energy through the air through the ether um i'm i'm not sure she that's her thing too from what i understand is that she doesn't know what it is or you know where it is or who's running it but the only way that it could happen is through that and it's demonstrable and repeatable you know other people have done similar things and i think uh even one of the things in it is a patent that nikola tesla had involving uh radiant energy and harnessing energy and uh you know a lot of stuff along those lines uh yeah sh sh you'd have to just read the book really well, you know I, I worry and wonder about it being potentially just a test run for project bluebeam because they said that what they would do is have hologram ufos over major cities and 
but in the UFO holograms, they would have actual military craft. And they said they could use the actual military craft to cause havoc down below. So, right. uh, you know, uh, collapse buildings, say, like they did in the Independence Day movie, where you see the goes down and it's very similar to what happened, what, five years later um, yep. in the World Trade Center. And however they did that, if they could do that, imagine imagine multiple World Trade Center collapses in New York, London, Paris, you know, all over the world simultaneously with UFOs in the in the air and their buildings are going like that. And then on the TV, the government's saying UFO invasion and, you know, it's going to that would be the ultimate yeah, the Hagley world order Iraq. deception. Yeah. I mean, and it's what the, you know, Reagan talked about in that UN speech, and it's it, going back to as far as, like, Roswell, it feels to me like they've been setting up the big, the, the big deception for a century now, you know, and we're just about to the playtime, I think, and yeah, it totally. seems like, like 9-11 was just making sure that it's going to work. So, I mean, they had to make sure that the buildings will come down. They have to see the devastation. They have to yeah. get the media, media machine going. Oh, and then, of course, the what happened three years ago and where they got to shut down the entire world. Lockdown. Quarantine. Okay, so they've now successfully prepared us and themselves with the knowledge they need to take down buildings. They have the hologram technology. They got us thinking aliens exist and we're on a spinning ball in outer space. And then uh, they, they, with one word, you know, oh, there's, a, there's a, scary, a scary thing in the air. Everybody in the entire world now can't go outside. You know, imagine th they're just they're leveling it up, you know, 9-11 and CV-19 to me seem like step one, step two. And step three is going to be so big that, like, just discussing it when I talk about this, it just seems like so ridiculous, doesn't it? Like, like, yeah, like it, are it we really going to live real, like dude. we're going to live through a, like an Independence Day scenario? It just seems so far fetched, but it doesn't. It really does. It, it to me, uh, like every every day, I feel like they're this putting is it on the thing I wanna... news and stuff now. UFOs, UFOs, UFOs. They're normalizing it, man. Just exactly. like everything else. You're you're right. And it could have been. Uh, I didn't want to cut you off when you were talking about it, but the no planes, you know. And I was gonna mention that that I think it w was exactly what you were saying. Like maybe it was no planes but like you said it would be maybe say a drone right and then they're blue beaming around it to make it look like a big commercial airliner or a military plane or, or whatever however exactly they went about it you know that's up to speculation and conjecture obviously but uh it's it could have been a double see can we fool people right here with their eyes you know because you know it's not like it didn't happen at all new york's a huge city i have friends who lived in new york at the time and they didn't see the planes, but they saw it all happening. And there were real eyewitness accounts from what I understand. You know, they're, they're, I think there was something that went into that. And it what could very well have been a test, like you said. And, you know, okay, we got the hologram part down and we got the weapon part down. We just did two in one and we directed it perfectly. We didn't destroy any buildings over here. We didn't destroy any of this. We got right where we wanted and got paid out on it and we got to go start an endless war over it like it was such it was the ultimate wasn't mm. the tsa supposed to be two weeks only it's mm. going to be a two-week thing just for your safety kind of like the other thing that just happened where it was only going to be two weeks, two weeks right to flatten two that weeks curve flat <laughs> it all starts with temporary for your protection you know and then before you know it it's just your life I'm thinking of like my great grandfather, you know, living. He he was born before radio, you know. And then when I was born, we already had TV and, and phones and stuff. And then internet came along when when I was uh, growing up. And that, but like people now, like if you are born now, 
you don't know a world that didn't have internet and cell phones and YouTube and and you know oh yeah and, all, this, and yeah. all that dude I still man yeah I'm sure you do too you know there's little kids still you see the kid and their parent whacked right. up like that you know that that's their life that's their reality and their paradigm like how's how, how scary is the alien invasion? Yes, but how scary is that? Like, they did it. It doesn't matter what you and I think, really, you know? And the, the I feel like that's what the true attack always is. It's on the children. I was a little... I was six when 9-11 happened, you know? And that did something to me. Like, everybody my age all has that certain... I don't know what it's like. I didn't ever have a time before the Patriot Act, before TSA, all that, you know? My whole reality has been essentially obviously you know I was six I had a little bit of a life but my that's when your personality really starts forming you really start becoming aware and that was one of the things that really made me like aware of like wow the world is serious you know there's war on tv and all this stuff you're I was really ignorant to a lot of that until that happened so just thinking about that on me it's the exact same thing that you just said you know and what your grandparents thought about you oh Eric on the internet right. you know right. it's it was a uh, totally different world to them and it's the same with us with the children now like yeah man i feel so bad for them i i would think that all the time when i'm looking at our children running around i think like i feel like i'm doomed but i'm so much more worried about them you mm. know the way everything's going yeah it's like they're they're just born into a world that's been so manipulated on every front that they are unconsciously manipulated and molded and and massaged in ways that they don't even realize and then they come out a certain type of person that is so different than my great grandparents were to the point that and, and they they're all dead now so they don't they're not even going to be able to understand the type of people my great grandparents were and you know like I, I cling to it like it's like uh, you know a type of humanity that no longer exists and, and, and like, I only have a memory of it. And then like the next generation, like I'm saying, they don't even have a memory of it. Yep. So then it's gone. You, you don't know what it was like to know people who existed before all mass media. To just be normal people. You don't know what that was, yep. you know. Yep. I got to meet a couple of them. They were super old when I was a kid. And they were some of the nicest Definitely. people that, you know, I ever met. And loving and just attentive, present Right, right, right. Definitely. That's a, dude, you hit the nail on the head with that. Attentive and in the present, living in the moment. Like my grandmother lived with us, uh, you know, my whole life. And she was just so so like that. One one thing at a time, the crossword, you know, <laughs> reading, whatever it is. Kids today and people today are just all over the place. And it's caused like how much can you really blame them i feel like i heard it in one of your other conversations of where you're talking about there's just so much karma going around you mm -hmm. know like and everyone's giving karma off to each other and vice versa uh i feel like it's almost inevitable now to to not be attentive and to get dragged into distractions and all these other things a lot of our grandparents i feel like a lot of them they really didn't have any choice right it was just their reality and mm -hmm. like you're saying kids now born into this they're going to have no choice because everyone around them isn't going to be doing the raw humanity that was of the past. You know, everyone else around you is absorbed into it. So naturally, you think it's normal to be playing on the iPad constantly or whatever it might be, you know, and then it just becomes your reality. And then those kids have kids and they have kids. And we've hit a point now with tech where it's make or break time, like you said. Like we're gonna live through Independence Day, and there's gonna be a a big shift for sure. And I know people have been saying that for a long time, but uh, we're at the point technologically now where I think it's definitely a a real possibility in the near future. Both uh, Independence Day and Terminator, with all the AI and yep. stuff going on now. Do you know who Ted Kaczynski is? Yeah. Did you ever read his book? His manifesto? No, yeah. I've never read it. No, I have a buddy who uh, has always tried to get me to, but I just have never read it. So, so there's this guy, his name's Ted Kaczynski, and he was a really smart 
kid and he went to Harvard and uh, graduated and then he was a professor of mathematics and then he just decided to move into the woods and go completely off grid um, have his own water and uh, you know no electricity no water and everything and he started writing this manifesto and it's called the uh, industrial society and its future and some of the some of the things that he talked about that are really interesting in it are he talks about how as humans we have the drive similar to how like Nietzsche or Schopenhauer would have said we have the drive to a power process like a will um, and it's it's what drives our humanity and and so we, for instance what we all need is to set goals for ourselves and then work towards achieving those goals and then to succeed in achieving some of those goals that's the first three steps of his power process and then the fourth step was through achieving some of those hard-earned goals we need to develop some level of freedom or autonomy by doing so which makes sense but you develop some sort of skill or you have a goal you um, are diligent and overcome obstacles to achieve it then you now have a good or a service or a skill or something that allows you to now operate in the world with more freedom and autonomy more power what, what he's saying though now since um, industrial society and technology has come about uh, people don't have the opportunity to do this power process to its completion because even if we set up real goals for ourselves and achieve them in the end the the government and the technocracy the, the technology which i'll we'll get into he, he shows how the two of them are so interlinked um makes it so that we can't gain more power or autonomy or freedom from completing this power process so instead we're doing surrogate activities to give us the feeling of completing the power process such as video games for example is a, an easy one where you set a goal you know you, you work hard to achieve the goal right and then you achieve it and you feel good for five seconds but then the fourth step which is the most important part of his power process is that we actually have to achieve some lasting skill power freedom or autonomy in the world at large based on this effort that you've put out um and he also gives examples like you know getting really good at hitting a golf ball for example a lot of people do stuff like that these are surrogate activities for the power process and what they've resulted in is fragmented demented weakened slave-like people who are just doing these surrogate activities like sports and video games and and he mentions even even working like a workaholic who works more hours than he needs to just to make a bit more money but even that extra money doesn't give him any higher really quality of life so so that extra work is again just a surrogate activity that's not providing him any any more autonomy it's actually enslaving him more so yeah i was gonna say definitely <laughs> doing the opposite for sure right so uh, so he gives these examples and then he, he's trying to say that a lot of um like uh, depression and um psychological ailments that we have in society are based on people not being able to go through this natural power process and um gain a level of autonomy in their own lives and that's what sent him to go live by himself without water and without electricity and to try and you know make it on his own that way but he, he had a, a second part of his philosophy that of course um is a lot more well known and notorious and um and that was the other part i said about how government and technology are like these two forces that are working together and they have to because of the the nature of humanity and government basically it's like a technology a new technology comes into existence and then the people either like like for instance 
cars. At first, there's no laws or anything about them. It's a new technology. It's innovative. It's positive. The people like it. The people uh, manufacturing it are making money. People driving the cars are liking it. So there's like no negative to it. But then at, over time, then you start to need to build roads and then pedestrian crossings and traffic lights and licenses and uh, insurance and uh, you know all of these and all these taxes and all these other things, laws and regulations start coming into play now. And the people usually demand them um, because they, you know, it's human nature. It's like as these technologies that they need either protection from them or protection from, from other people using them or whatever. And so similar to like I'm thinking of uh, with how you got CCTV cameras everywhere. But then if somebody has a handheld, everyone's got a problem. In public, yep. <laughs> Even um, though you're surrounded by a trillion cameras all the time. <laughs> It's that kind of idea. Um, so he gives the idea, the, the example of cars and uh, internet would be another one, or cell phones now it would, would be a big one where like at first, sure, cell phones seem like it's a great technology and the people manufacturing are making money, the people who buy the iPhone 1 when it first comes out, they're just, wow, amazing. And, and it is at that point. And there's no regulation and it's this freedom to be had, you know, when these technologies first come out, <clears throat> uh, they are, you know, what they should be. But then the government comes in because both the people want and the government wants to control them. And then it creates this enslaving effect. So, for instance, with phones now, now. Uh, you have to use your phone to get into certain stores. I, I heard they have like Amazon stores that you can't even get into now without using your phone. And then you go into the store and then you have to use your phone to pay for the things in the store. And so, so that's an example now of a technology that is now, it's fast forward into the future that if, um, if all stores were like that, for example, now you can't not have a cell phone or else you can't have a bank account. You know, you can't uh, get into a store, you can't buy things. And so this technology, cell phone, which 20 years ago was awesome. Now, well, maybe I've still never had, I hate cell phones, honestly, but I mean, I can, I can understand why people like cell phones and, and I can see that it was a good thing kind of back then, but now, like, do people really still think that this technology is that great? And the same with most technologies. And this is what Ted Kaczynski was trying to get at. And he felt that there was an inevitability in which te technology and government just keep going forward and forward to basically, he, he talked about a point that is happening, I think, this month or last month, which is where AI comes into effect and is suddenly able to do things more efficiently, more intelligently, uh, more ABC than humans. And so we have to make the executive decision as humanity whether we start taking our orders from this thing or not. And that's what people, you know, people are now using chat GPT to give essays and to uh, comedians are using it to write jokes for them. and. There's a bunch of stuff they're doing, you know, it's, right now it's funny, right? It's new and whatever. Yeah, it's wait fine. till it's the president is AI of the the whole one world government because, because he's AI smarter. can run it better than a human, it, you know, no emotions. They'll give a list of a reasons why it's so much better than a, than people. And he said that we're going to do exactly what we're doing when we get to this point, And that is we're just going to agree that, well, yeah, as AI continues getting smarter and smarter, faster and faster, more and more reliable, more and more all pervasive, the idea of boycotting or shutting it out almost becomes impossible. It becomes, like I said, especially with the, as new generations become born, millennials or whatever the next generation, <laughs> we're going to call them the, the AI generation, you know, the generation that doesn't know what it's like to exist without AI around them at all times. Yeah. This this fake thing, this fake intelligence 
that's more intelligent than your real intelligence <laughs> and, and we're like being gaslighted into believing that this thing is is more intelligent than us and, and yeah. we should follow its dictates and and when it comes up with conclusions its conclusions are better than yours because it's factoring in the entirety of all human knowledge and then coming out with it but if people have toyed with chat gpt and some of these a little bit say ask them some flat earth questions or conspiracy questions or or, or other things that you know you know to be true for instance but the world at large thinks is crazy well chat gpt is going to call you crazy you know yeah it's proving that uh, ai is no better at coming up with actual truth than the masses so that's all ai is is democracy ai is just the stupid masses ai is an npc yep, that's what it's learning from anyways exactly so it is uh it's the and biggest it should, NPC. it's all exactly. of them it's you know? the npc yep. and it should be shunned and it should be boycotted though probably not in the method that ted kaczynski uh wanted <laughs> and so what he did was after he wrote this book talking about what would happen and the future of society uh he thought that the only way to a get his message heard and b stop this seemingly inevitable future was to kill people and so he said it in his book and he decided he became the unabomber which is what people know him as he's now 80 years old and in jail and i kind of think of him like john connor in the terminator he's basically a prophetic person who decided to take a violent angle in trying to achieve his ends um and at the time you know everybody was just oh against him including his own brother which is who um got him so what so what happened is basically after he sent out mail bombs to a bunch of people who were in the technology sphere and killed a few of them injured many more um he said that he, he contacted the new york times and the los angeles time washington post a few papers that he he personally trusted and said that he would um stop his mail bombing campaign if they would publish his book in their paper and i guess janet reno at the time campaigned to allow that to happen and it did his his manifesto got published in the the new york times um in like 1992 i think um or 95 i don't remember the year now and he stopped he, he stopped mail bombing people like he said he would but shortly after it came out uh his brother noticed the writing style and figured he thought he knew who it was and told the FBI like if you can keep my identity then I can let you know and they assured him that they would keep his identity and he told them who who he thought it was and they went there and they found him in there and he had bomb supplies and he had uh drafts of his manifesto and everything so it was clearly him but within 4 days somehow word got back that it was his brother that dobbed him in so they um they had a big falling out of course from that I, I don't think they've gotten back from um so yeah it just seems pretty prophetic definitely don't agree that violence is something that was needed but it's definitely a great read uh pretty much agree with most everything that he says in it it's way more applicable in 2023 than it was when he wrote it and um you know it's a shame that he took that angle and and had to go down that road because his words are really important and right. you know we really should pay attention and and look not look past what he did but i mean anyone that would just think like oh this is a, a murderer and he's in jail and oh, you know well you know this gray this 
Fifty Shades of Grey, let's say. You know, the issues aren't always black and white. People right. like to think it's it's real simple like that. But Nobody's like, perfect either, you know. No one no one is that's like a holier than thou mindset. You can learn from anybody and you can also learn from people's mistakes too, as well, you know. You don't necessarily have to think every single thing he did was good to agree with the the good right. parts, you know, for that's sure. Right. Like definitely. That's or a, right. yeah. yeah. And just like Ted Kaczynski said, it's it's the inevitability of technology and government. And I think both of them should be stopped and boycotted, technology and government. I mean, especially government. As you know, I'm a voluntarist or anarchist is another word for that. That word has been so demonized, I like to go with voluntarist. But the idea is that government is completely illegitimate and unnecessary. And it's just been faking legitimacy for hundreds of years now, making us think that it's a necessary evil when it's not. Um, and technology, as we said, technology is a funny one because it comes into the world with a smile and ends you leaving, you know, it's like that mask, the, the theater mask with the smile and the frown. Like technology comes in with that smile and inevitably in the end, it always ends up with the frown because because of the, just the human nature, something about it, it, we enslave ourselves to these technological conveniences that we that we create for ourselves and then by doing so we remove our own humanity so you get a you get a dishwashing machine and you, you no longer know how to wash dishes doesn't seem like much but wait until there's a machine to do absolutely everything to the point you just kind of sit there and like a spoon just kind of kind yeah, like your soup kid. or whatever maybe yeah. another another machine like moves, <laughs> moves your jaw for you and you're like this is so convenient do you yeah. remember chewing? Chewing was One awful. putting a mask on for you. Oh, yeah, of course. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's that's just how it gets. I mean, we're, we're not at that point yet, of course. But if you if we go back to my great-grandparents, and they saw me, and probably my slavish existence here, I got my own, I got, you know, I'm thinking of idiocracy again with the, um, his little, his little chair that he shits in, you know? <laughs> so they're just sitting there they don't even they got the big widescreen tv and he's got like a straw food thing or something yep. he's just like eating super <laughs> violent television it's like that uh yeah ouch my balls yeah yeah uh there's one what is it the tosh daniel tosh his television show is all essentially that like you know a long time ago people would have felt some empathy and maybe concern for their fellow human being but now millions of people sit in a chair with a straw stuffed in their mouth laughing at someone getting hit by a car and like some real serious tragedy well the cell phones i was just thinking about that one um when something important um is happening in the present moment in reality that bystanders could change the outcome of now because we have this new technology now we just watch and yep. record and same with and like at concerts like all concerts now is just a bunch of people going like this nobody's in the present moment even if you're there yeah you know but and it's not like a full vr headset or anything like that <laughs> psychologically like mentally you're not which this is just a vehicle for that you know this is a vessel to experience through your consciousness so you're really not there if you're just staring at the phone or your your mind is engaged elsewhere you know if you're not in the present then you're not experiencing it really and again if you were born into a world that always had cell phones you might not really understand what it's like to have that level of consciousness and presence and attentiveness that i'm saying that my great grandparents had naturally and that I have to like meditate every day to try and maintain <laughs> because like like you said, the way the world is just living in society now, the level of karma or whatever you want to call it, the level of you're just being inundated by um, thought forms, uh, egregores that just memes they're just inundating your head all the time even if you try to shut yourself out from it and you try to take your social media vacation or your technology break that doesn't mean everyone else in the world around you ha has done that and so 
it barrels on regardless and you're basically just unaware <laughs> um, um, so it it's an example of the, how cell phones are a great example of showing how it's cognitively you know um, impairing us yeah totally and, dude and socially like on every possible level it is impairing for sure taking us out of the moment putting us into past and future because oh this is going to be great when i get to watch it back meanwhile the concerts happening yeah. you know yeah. oh and I, the isn't very good. I forgot to press record <laughs> oh concert's <laughs> over <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean it fuels uh i think um one of the worst things about it dude and i've always thought this is like what it does to and i you know i was around when the smartphone thing like my last year of high school probably you know 10 or 11 years ago is when it seemed like smartphones were really like pretty much everybody had one even young people and seeing uh young girls just like their self-image you know what they thought about themselves is out the window like it's it's absolutely disgusting how people feel about themselves and just how they have to feel like i have to present my life to the world on a fucking app like i don't know i just don't understand it i don't use any social media and i use a flip phone so when you do remove yourself out of it, you know, you just see how like how how much it's impairing people around you, you know, when they're trying to take a selfie with you and oh, it didn't come out good. Cut it off here. Let's do another one. I'm like, I didn't even want to take the first one, <laughs> you know, and here we are on fucking number six. Like, you know, you look great. Don't worry about it. It's the most useless thing you could possibly think about. You know, it keeps you so trapped in the Maya. It's like an illusion in the illusion almost. Totally. Right. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, like you said, it always starts out good. It, it could be anything and it ends up getting usurped. Even if people do use it for good, there's always, you know, government and whatever this faceless mafia you want to call it. Um, you know, they're going to usurp it and use it to their advantage. Like a printing press was a great way at a point where it was free and freedom of speech and you could write books all over and, you know, self-publish without things happening. And then now it becomes a way for propaganda to be fed to you. So even if it wasn't people staring at their phone and getting the CV-19, you know, I think that's really how that worked was they had to, that's why they didn't do it until then. Like you said, it's, it's things like that are planned for a, a century or more even. They had to wait. If you tried to do that in 1995, nobody would, a lot less people would have just went along with it because right. their jobs wouldn't just pay them for two weeks and you don't have to come in. And you can work from home. I don't need to work. Everything's through Zoom. Now now we're really losing even more. I'm stuck in my house. They're doing all these other, you know, all the uh, totalitarian things to you. And they're losing, you're losing the privacy as well. You can't even be at work. Not that there's not cameras there, but it's not the same uh, effect, if you know what I'm saying. You know, I don't think it would have worked. 20 years ago they had to wait for technology to advance to a point not only that but wait till it was normalized and everybody mm -hmm. liked it like you said mm -hmm. just like everything else with cars and everything and now everyone's got the phone it's free you can do whatever you want there's private messaging apps and all this it's glorified and then they take it and use it against you um exactly. yeah kaczynski was right on point with everything for sure we're, we're living in it right now right they're just about to close that trap door behind us where you're not going to be able to survive in society without owning a cell phone at all times. You can't yeah. leave your house without it. It has to be at your side all the time. If you break it or you know, it gets lost. The battery you know, dies. It's like an electric it's, car. It's, what it's going to be. Dies? I can't go to the bank. Like. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and think about that, people, before you, you know, allow this society to come into existence, yeah. because this is the thing people are they're just going along to get along or they're going with what's convenient or what's trendy or what seems cool at the time rather than looking to the future of what these technologies actually mean for us as a whole which and it basically means our complete enslavement and so <clears throat> we need to descale our reliance on technology and we need to get back to paper money 
absolutely like this whole digital currency thing and the idea of everybody paying th with things through their phones like i don't do it uh, i don't want to there's places like i can't go to certain places anymore because of it and so i i have yep. to tell them i mean i do tell them and i recommend other people do because th this is our power we have the two things we can do is not pay money where we shouldn't and do pay money where we should and vocalize it so in other words these businesses like subway sandwich shop here i don't know if everywhere in in the world now they you you can't even pay for anything in cash anymore and so it's all digital payments that's so bugged out yeah and that's the, so scary think, yeah and uh there's there's a whole bunch of stores are doing we prefer digital payments and they got like signs showing up and it's like and the the cashier will mention it first and so you have to be like the stick in the mud to to do the normal thing and be like no i have cash like a normal person um and so i'm telling these people like we prefer cashless payment I, I i tell them i prefer cash payment and i would like if you can to tell your manager the same and that if you uh go to cashless like some of these other businesses are doing you will completely lose my business forever yep and then i did that with the mask you know and it was the same thing too at, at first it was oh we recommend or we prefer or you know a person standing at the door would you like one no i'm good you know that flew for the first little bit and then next time you go there and the lady's sitting there with one and you say no all of a sudden well you're not coming in you know mm -hmm. and yeah, I either a lot of times I just did anyways I, in like some bigger stores, you know, some big chain places that I would have to go in. Um, I would just walk by them and and not wear it and just go about my business usually and whatever. It, we had like a couple of times where there was police and some other things like that, but it was worth it in the end, you know, for sure. I, I held my integrity, lost a job over it too, um, but still in the end, here we are a few years later and look at you all now really you know yeah and the I mean, same boycott the small shops and tell them to their face why and why what they're doing is wrong and all of that dude you got to hold your integrity no matter what even if you lose it doesn't matter you know you you held to what's right and true especially for yourself and that's keep that's the most important thing i think along with like voluntarism anarchism is putting the power back in the individual along with paper money too how many uh how many w women are getting not just women but for example you know they're in a domestic violence situation and they can't stash their little cash away every once in a while to dip one night in the middle mm -hmm. of the night and get out of that situation how are you supposed to do that how mm -hmm. are you supposed to do the tooth fairy for your kids you know how is grandpa supposed to sneak you five bucks when when no one's looking like all of that all of those little things are going to be out the window a thing of the past people really don't get it yeah and as the government becomes more and more encroaching and has rules and regulations that are more and more anti-humanity yeah uh, you're gonna need that privacy of cash just to operate in in the world you know P people yep. think that like the government's just always going to be uh, on their side and and they're never going to have to do anything that would be illegal but as this new world order keeps coming and more and more laws keep keep coming in even if you try to be a good little slave the best you can like the the girl with the chip chip in her you know she was being the best slave she could possibly be she was their spokesperson and then she experienced some side effect or whatever and realized the the truth and it's too late so uh that's that's the message people need to to see with these things it's like be proactive <laughs> don't yep. wait until it's too late and the the door has locked shut behind us um yeah which it will be and, and going along with that you know um not only are you lo losing the privacy of it and you lose all like the you know you can't dodge taxes anymore no one will be getting paid under the table all, all of those things that go along with it that are negative what Freedom. happens when, yeah you know everything that goes along with it what happens when they decide oh well steven eric yep fl flat earth 
Yeah, all right, we're denoting. All right, we're taking away 20 social credits off of you. You know, oh, your your milk is rationed. Your uh, bananas this week. You've had three, so you can't have any more or whatever it might be. You know, that's not only the privacy and all the other stuff, but once you once you can't use your own money, then what's even the point? You know, when you're being restricted. I've seen it in China where uh, it was a public restroom and it scanned your face. And the social credits dispensed a certain amount of toilet paper out for you. <laughs> uh, be a good little slave and you'll get four squares. Like, that's, it's, you know, we laugh at it. But it's just like the alien invasion thing. Like, that could very well be happening soon all across the whole world. Like, the repercussions are immense. And like you said, once the trap door is closed and that power is in place and, and the your money, for example, and the money has gone then it's too late and we're doomed and there will be civil wars and breakaway societies and stuff, which I mean, it's happened throughout history as well. So it may just need to happen. I think another process that's happening due to all this is infantilization. Like how he said that we need the power process to, to have these goals and achieve them and to gain more freedom and autonomy in our lives. Um, and when, when we don't, and when we just do these surrogate activities and playing games, and meanwhile, the, the cage of enslavement keeps getting smaller and smaller and the locks are, are, are around us, we're basically like little kids versus, say, my great-grandparents. Like, they had their own land. I'd see him out there, you know, at 80, 90 years old, you know, he'd take me out I'd be on the tractor with him you know he's plowing the fields they got raspberries and blueberries and um, potatoes and you know they grow everything they got a barn they they, they look after their house and um, just and the, like I said their presentness their attentiveness the the quality of human being that they clearly were was a very wise very wise and adult. I mean, as I was, what I'm saying is we're now we're infantilized. I feel like adults nowadays, a bunch of them, are basically tall children. You know, they're just like yep. mentally, they are what my great grandparents might have been at 12 years old or yeah, something. Dude, I literally said that to my lady yesterday. I just got a new job and. Uh, I was, I was growing pot with my two best friends. I live in Colorado. Uh, my friend Nate owns a wholesale recreational facility. So whatever, uh, for the past five years, you know, I've been in that, like me and my two best friends who watch your videos, you know, we're listening to your podcasts at work. That's mm. the level we were at. So we mm. were super removed from society. <laughs> it's just us three in there talking shit about all the NPCs for eight hours a day mm. in a fake little world. Uh, mm. But either way, I just had to move and uh, I moved a few hours away and I live in like a I was living up in the mountains, too. So it was like pretty secluded. My whole county only had a couple thousand people. And now I live uh, on the edge of Colorado. And it's like a to me, it seems like a, a huge city now, you know, because I was a bit removed, but not many, maybe like 60,000 people. Um, and it's I had to get a job in like a, a little bit more of a public place and a normal in a bakery and uh yeah i literally just said that exact same thing just being around normal people i haven't done that in so long and you just hear the things people are talking like not just the things they're talking about um uh i wouldn't really judge them i, I don't know you know it's it's a fine line between judging and just th realizing that you live in a different paradigm than them there's there's no judgment on like what they were saying but it's just the fact that you would waste i really try not to even talk about meaningless stuff you know every single breath is it could very well be your last the next you know so do you really want to waste it talking about sports or movies or whatever it might be and it's like you're 45 years old man like or however old you know what old that seems like significantly older to me because i'm under 30 even but it just yeah i i know what you're saying it's insane um and they're inf like you said they they literally are infants uh not only through government and like tech doing it to them but just uh 
emotionally and the convenience of everything we have too i think you know people emotionally just uh are shriveled up like raisins almost it seems and the convenience you know you got your cup and i got my kombucha and my i don't even have to smoke a bowl i can just push a button and <laughs> you know hit a vape pen like that's where we're at you know and we're we're all in there baking mm-hmm. like using ovens use like using just things that weren't there even you know, say 150 years ago, obviously, they, they, or 100, you know, obviously they had ovens, but it was a, a different level. And it's mm. just insane, like, seeing people the way they are. Yeah, I agree totally. And so Ted Kaczynski's um, diametric opposite that he um, built to technology was nature. And so the recommendation is that we go back to nature in every aspect that we can and that will remove us from these technological advances and that's what i was meaning when i was thinking about how like we seem infantilized versus my great grandparents with their own land and working it and with their own food that's the autonomy that's the freedom that they had a hundred years ago you know and the taxes weren't so big the, the restrictions and the laws that we have now today and and like like if my great grandfather could live these hundred years until he was two hundred, and he could experience these hundred years, like I feel like every step of the way, he would be against all of these encroaching technologies and government overreach, because he would see <clears throat> and feel how they are infantilizing him and taking away his autonomy to just be a free man on this earth on his land and being nowadays like you said the uh, agenda 2030 or whatever you got that wef guy saying that we're gonna own nothing and be happy that's their plan that's their ultimate goal is they don't want us to have any autonomy so no private money no private land they're gonna own it all you just get to rent it um and that so again if we're going to go against this if we're going to fight these people the, this two ways you have to boycott them and go towards whatever the opposite is and so the thing we have to boycott is all of these technologies and the government and the uh, renting of of things and we need to get back to owning things well maybe that's another we can talk about because you sent me that book about what is property this is another we're gone there's another level over that but but for, on the current level we need to get back to owning our own land and uh you know having our own autonomy so that we can grow our own food, build our own houses and have our own lives in our own areas that is based on our handiwork. Mm-hmm. Now that that's what we've lost is the ability to just be a human on the earth, survive, build, grow, you know, live like that. It, you can't do that. You're you're a robot in a machine, and you have to rent land, or even if you buy it, you have to pay taxes on it. And then, um, you know, it, it's the, we've been so far removed from natural autonomous living that people now who try it, um, you have to have a bunch of money, like I said, to buy the land, to go off grid, to buy all the tools and all the things that are necessary, and the, the time it takes years to be able to actually grow all your own food, like and, and then dig a well, get the water, and use your compost toilet, and all this stuff. It's romanticized now, and it's really difficult to actually do it because to go from the current system to try and go back to nature like that, you basically you go back to nature through the system by spending a bunch of money, have somebody dig a well. For, so you're not actually doing it. So you're still not doing what we used to do, you know, like my, like my grandparents or, or whatever, great grandparents or before them even, because technology has progressed the way the, the, the world is. Trying to get back to that is is almost impractical. It all comes, if you want to change the collective, the real thing, I think you, you hit the nail on the head with like, growing your own food especially even that's such a big one a lot of people like you know there's some situations where it can't work but even if you're growing a tomato plant in a pot on your yard well if 331 million people in you know united states say if 331 million people 
grow one tomato plant or whatever it might be, you know, that's that much of an impact out from, from one small little move. I teach my kids out constantly. We go clean up. Just today we were cleaning up the playground in town. And I tell them, you know, wh- why would you ever vote for somebody? Why would you ever go drive a car and potentially make more trash and whatever to vote for some people? Because I'm sure they're pushing, you know, I try and let them know the climate change bullshit. And uh, I let them know if you want to do something for the world, you just go do it. Mm. If I want the park to be clean for us to play at, well, all right, let's just clean it up ourselves. And there you go. Now we did it. We don't need to have anyone else do it for us. Just petition the government, get them to <laughs> to do it for us, right? Clean up the parks. We need to hire new people. Pay more well, taxes. What, you know, it, it's it's just like I don't, I don't know if AI could be used for good, but I think, uh, like you said, a lot of uh, all the all the things are good, and then they're usurped. Like taxes could be a thing that could potentially not taxes, but uh, like voluntar- voluntarism. You know, everybody always says, well. You know, who's going to pay for the roads or whatever? Well, okay, you're willing to give it up to get the roads. So just voluntarily give it up to a to an independent business who and they can build the roads. You know, you think roads didn't exist before your pay, pay, paychecks were getting taxed? Like, and, the, and of course, if it's if the the voluntarist government that was taking your donated money and putting it to the roads was doing it to your road, of course you'd pay for it. But if you're just giving random taxes to the IRS of the entire United States and they just say like, yeah, we'll we'll do your road there in Maine and, and you know, wherever you are, like, how do they know how, you know, there's no accountability there. Right, and, you can't and opt you out to, of any of it. Yeah, there's you no know, opting out. I'm well, no opting you get out of NASA. World, yeah. Once you get to a one-world order, and you're paying your taxes to them and expecting, making sure that the the your your road in Timbuktu is gonna get paved, like you're really gonna gonna like. This is when the whole idea of government gets exposed as illegitimate because the only thing that matters is what's near you. The only governance that actually makes sense is your immediate area. So any governance that's larger than, say, a town or, or a city, city would be about the largest scale of governance you'd have. And in a sane society, there wouldn't even be big cities, I don't think. Like, people wouldn't want to live. Right. In a big, the only reason mega cities like this are happening now is because the way society is being structured, they want people this way. And there's a whole bunch of elements of society that are pushing us to be this way. For example, housing and jobs becoming increasingly difficult to not live in these mega cities that they've constructed for us. Yeah, I mean, people are going to be people inherently. Everyone has good and bad. You know, I've done plenty of bad things in my life and harmed people just like everybody else. You know, I think we've all definitely made mistakes. So that's going to happen in any in, in a family. It happens, you know, between two people. It only takes more than one person for them to wrong somebody else, you know, and odds are. I mean, sometimes people, you know, make mistakes and you either learn from it or you don't. But either way, that being said, uh, I agree totally. There needs to be some form of that. And it's just like, I'm, you know, of course, natural law, you know, do no harm. That's it. That's the law. Mm. And beyond that, any law is just trivial mafia, you know, coercion to steal your money. Really? Right. How can so there be easy. a victimless crime? <laughs> Right. What does that even that's like getting arrested when I was a teenager? I got arrested for resisting arrest. <laughs> what was I being arrested for? That was my question. So I got <laughs> resisting arrest, but what was I getting resist arrested for? Nothing for using my voice. Wow. You know, I, I was talking shit to a cop, but uh, yeah, that one baffled me. Even as a kid, I remember thinking, like. How can I possibly get charged with just resisting arrest? Like, exactly. That could, only be a, that could only be a secondary charge. Right. If you, if you, Something else. A primary charge is resisting arrest. <laughs> what does that really mean? You know? Yeah. Well, I, like you said, it's obviously because uh, a uniformed goon used his privilege above the law to take your freedom away. And, you know. Uh, resisting arrest. There we go. 
They can take your freedom away yep. now. That's and that, again, this is why we don't need government because we don't need a special class of people that are above everyone else that get to make laws and be above the laws. And that's what politicians, uh, police, military, and other government workers are essentially, is uh, a special class through virtue of their special job that they applied for, which is especially immoral because of the fact that it takes its paycheck from all of us. You know, Every other job you could <laughs> get, your customers pay you for the good or service that you provide them. That's what business is. But government is just absolute enslavement. It's just a mafia. It's not a business. They, they, don't, they don't offer you a service and then you like the service. And so you're like, okay, here's more taxes, government. Thanks for spending them so wisely. If, <laughs> if that was the case, everyone would be fine with it, but it's not right. the case. And so that's the issue. And it, it, it's at what is that like 40 percent in america some some places have 50 percent like there's no thing that any outside entity can perform for me that i'm going to willingly give up 50 percent of my income to that other entity so that they can infantilize me for life yeah and i can just be this convenience whore living life where uh, they they do everything for me, and they and it's not even that good. That that would be if it was good. They don't they don't do everything for me. I still gotta work my entire life away just to give them half of it so that they can pave the roads for me or whatever and give me public school indoctrination. Yeah, buy helium. <laughs> buy helium for their satellites. <laughs> uh, it's crazy too. While you were saying that, I was thinking like, so you know these these people, yeah, they're. If you work for the government, like a police officer pays taxes on his paycheck, right? <laughs> so you're just robbing yourself to pay yourself too, you know? Isn't that kind of how it works? So you're kind of just stealing from yourself as well. It doesn't even make any sense, you know? <laughs> and they glor they glorify it, all those positions for sure. Right. It's like a way to virtue signal, you know? You're doing something, it's, it's this great thing, and you get all these benefits, and I get to be an infant from them. Here, they're going to give me all these things so I don't have to do them for myself, you know? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so people that are given, getting these jobs and thinking that they're getting a good job and that they should be respected in society because they're a politician or a policeman or a public school educator or a military man or whatever, I want these people to really question themselves again about this because your money is coming from us. You're stealing from us. And the only way that this system is going to stop is when everybody realizes that this is an immoral system and they refuse to engage in it. That's the only way a mafia or a gang or anything is going to stop is when the people within it realize that we don't want to live our life this way anymore. We want to do something more legitimate. It's more it's better for society. And, th and this is what government has gotten to. You know, government is no longer, nor would I say was it ever, good for society. And so for the people clinging to that idea that maybe government is necessary or, or is good for society, you really need to restructure that idea. And the people who are working for it and, and taking money by doing that, dude, like, you are you are a robber so all you government workers to me i don't i don't see you any differently than a guy that comes in the night and steals money out of my safe yep you're you're just doing it under the cover of being a, a good employee but a, a good employee sells a product or service that a customer chooses whether to buy or not all you government employees, we don't get that choice. You just get your paycheck regardless. You just yep. steal from us regardless. So, and that's why it's a good job. That's why it's a um, reliable job because you are going to get your money because you got the whole machinery of the government behind you to make sure you're, you're going to get your paycheck. Yep. But, but you uh, are the machinery, you know, the government you, is the because people the government doesn't exist. For it, right? Exactly. Yes. It's just an idea. Right. So all exactly. you people are the thing. Are the, yes, you are it. The so thing it's not that even a euphemism. Do, no, nobody wants to exist in that, you know, even them.
and but they don't want they, they don't want to live up to that they don't want to admit to themselves and to everyone else that their way of living is antithetical to everyone else's freedom and well-being <clears throat> it's a tough pill to swallow and it's difficult to get society to understand it and even more difficult to get the ones who are benefiting from it to stop so even even if these government employees understand what i'm saying and agree with me how many are going to have the integrity to stop i think uh the autonomy is pretty much the most important thing um because like we said you know even when it comes down to like doing a plant or whatever it might be whatever it is where you can support or create something on your own is the best uh i think freedom and self fr freedom anarchy self-governance uh autonomy they're all synonymous words for what everybody wants deep down you know that's what it, that's it's in the human soul uh definitely being washed out but that's yeah. the most important thing for sure and then, like you said you know with if cash ends up getting out thrown out the window then that goes there goes pretty much the only way because like you said you can't just go out and do most of these things you have to use the money you have to use the resources so if the cash goes out then your autonomy really goes out because now you're really being controlled and you could easily be shut off from doing that nope you're not allowed to buy soil you know <laughs> your social credit score doesn't fit up to it <clears throat> so let's go even on a higher philosophical level then and, and talk about that Proudhon book, What is Property, that you sent me. So, like, I've heard Native Americans, they had a belief that we couldn't own property or possessions and that all things of nature on Earth are as they are and we come from them. And so it couldn't possibly be ours <laughs> we can't take a little plot of land and say this is mine we can't uh, fashion a little spear out of a stick and, and then say that this stick is my stick you're just using it just like you're using that land um and so when i guess when the settlers came they said that the indians would give them the clothes off of their back and then when they needed them, they would ask for their clothes back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so they called them Indian givers, which is a term that still exists today, meaning this, somebody who gives you something as a gift, but then they ask for it back afterwards. Um, and that's a negative connotation. But it seems to stem from the European settlers' inability to understand the Native Americans' philosophy of uh, property and possessions in that, yeah, we're giving you <laughs> clothes and stuff now. I guess they, they swam out with clothes on their back to meet them with their ships even um, as, a, as a gesture and, and if you can use them and stuff. But yeah, if later on down the road, something that was, was given to you is now needed in the present moment by someone else, it, it, it's expected that you would just give it to them. No thought, right. no thought right. asked, I need it now. <laughs> And that's just how their society operated. But when you did that to the, the Europeans of the time, they're like, what? No, this is mine now. You gave it to me. You can't have it back. And, um, so uh, I'm just giving that as an introduction to this concept. I only read 100 pages of the book. Did you read the whole book? Uh, no, I've, I've read about the same amount for sure, okay. too. But I've read I'll, it. I'll read he, he has other books, too. Okay, I'll definitely read read more. It's interesting he to me. A, I, just... like, uh, I don't know if he knew Karl Marx or was involved with him, too, maybe. Mm. But, uh, yeah, he was an uh, anarchist so he... from the late 1800s. Okay, so he's not a communist. Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I'd never really looked into any of his work or anything before you sent it to me. But just thinking about, because his main premise, I guess, in the book is, Property is robbery. That's his uh, premise that he tries to prove throughout the course of the book. And I guess what he's basically saying is like this, like the Native Americans would have thought, is for you to come from Mother Earth and then to take a piece of Mother Earth or things, other, other aspects of it, 
fashion them in any which way and then claim that it's now yours and you own it, um, that would be tantamount to robbery because it's not yours. <laughs> so you're stealing it. <laughs> and then yep. by claiming ownership over it, uh, now you're creating a whole system that is stealing from everyone. <laughs> and everyone else is stealing from everyone else. And so uh, we've now basically codified for hundreds of years into law the legitimacy of everyone robbing from everyone else <laughs> and calling it property. Yep. Um, and you could yeah. take it even a step further philosophically, you know, and what is the, who is, 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 are you your property mm -hmm. or were the atoms and the molecules there before and you, were they not? I know the cells were growing, but I don't know. I mean, they're going to be there in decay afterwards, right? So even if they weren't there before, they're, they're going to be there long after you are and go into something else too. So, you know, what, who, who, who are you to have the property when this isn't even your property? You know, <laughs> this is just going to dissolve too, as well. That's deep, man. <laughs> it's, I don't it's know. True though. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Which kind of yeah? So, there's, there's the, so are we rob? Are we robbing? The like, are we spiritual robbers of these bodies? <laughs> maybe maybe existing in this entire world and having a body itself is, is a, a transgression against God. <laughs> <laughs> or something <laughs> getting so deep <laughs> i mean that's what yeah that's the way to be dude because because i think that concept really leads you to that in the end that's what that's kind of where my mind went with it once once i read it and do it a little bit and there there is kind of weird like i think there's nuances to to that as well uh like if Mons monsanto has done it to farmers you know where they'll like have a bird go drop a grain of uh, wheat or whatever it might be, you know, and then they come on and test the organic farmers' crops and, oh, well, this is Monsanto patented GMO. So now, even though it's your land, you tilled it all and made this soil fertile enough to even grow a plant out of it, well, this is our property now, you know, or if you uh, say you had some land and you own 100 acres and i was out just on the earth you know uh existing and there was a empty spot of land and i was eating an apple and i planted the seed and i grew the tree i watered it i fertilized it and everything unknowing that it was yours you know and uh who 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 gets the fruits of that labor mm. you know whose is it really it's your land well i put in all the labor into it so I don't know, man. The whole concept of it is just like everything else. It's a construct, really, you know, mm -hmm. like like you said, because in the end, then we're all just stealing from each other all the time and the earth is stealing from each other and there can't really be property. And we create this whole system of millions of statutes and codes of legalities to work within all of this. Whereas imagine if we were just back at the state of nature like in a Native American type of setting, ideology even, where you could just go somewhere in nature and build your hut or, or whatever and, and grow your food and everything. Uh, who's going to come, you know, if there's no government there to, to have its machinery descend upon you for doing something against its dictates, you know, what, who's going to come lay claim to your area and your, you know, your property and your possessions anyway. In other words, so you just go out in nature, you decide this is where I'm going to live. You don't have to call it property, but it's your little place. And then you build your house. You don't have to call it your possession, whatever, right. but it, it was based on your labor. Therefore, it's more, it sh just naturally, anyone would agree that it is more, you have more claim to it than they do if they just stumble upon the house later on. And in that situation, do you really need a whole legal system and courts and stuff to judiciate for you? Or can you just talk to the guy who's like, this is my house? And you're like, no, it's not. I built it and right. I live here and I just went to the market and I came back and you broke a window and now you're in my house um, and or whatever. You know, just giving examples of like that kind of thing is about you know, like what are people afraid of? People have this idea like 
that if we don't have government, there's going to be roving gangs of people, you know, the roving gangs are the police and the military. Yep. They, they are, we have that anyway, and that's what has created such a fragmented, terrible society that we have today. If you didn't have those things in place, people think it would be worse. It's like, no, you already have the worst version of that thing you're scared of. Right. right. And now you're you're scared of of scaling it back to, you know, how it would normally be in, in a more state of nature type of affairs in which it would definitely be less violent, less intrusive, easier to deal with. You'd have more autonomy. <laughs> but, I mean, they're living in that, right? You know, I mean, you saying that, that, that really made a lot of sense. Like if, you know, yeah, people are scared of that, of these dr violence and chaos and it's all going to collapse. Because as if a law or a code or a statute is the only reason I don't go around murdering people is because I'm going to go to jail for it. You know, like the vast majority of people aren't that way, I don't think. And in the end, again, it's part of life that things like that happen anyways. There's no perfect world. So that's 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 in the world no matter what, whether you have it, have government governance or not, you know, uh, and as if they're not committing mass murder on worldwide scales and genocide and and th robbery and taxation and you know all of it it's it's all happening anyways right now like you said you know yeah people are living in it right now anyways the, the, it's back to the like you know infantilism right is that the word you used yeah um yeah it's back to that you know not wanting to take responsibility a lot of people don't have the means either too a lot of people don't even uh have the uh i don't know arms you know whether it's guns or property or land or the drive even you know that that's been driven out of people to to not want to do it if uh if there was anarchy or voluntarism you can still have private security and stuff so you can still hire police you can still hire people to do the same kind of things that police did and also you can have militia which is the same thing military does, but better, uh, because they actually stay within your borders and defend your country rather than claiming to do so from outside the borders. Um, and if there were roving gangs, you know, raping and pillaging and burning houses down and stealing things or whatever, I think in, in a state of nature like that, you would have good humanity that would b bind together to take care of them. Uh, I don't, people make it make it seem like if if there were no system of government, the bad elements of society would instantly congregate into big groups of terrible things. But all the good people in society would just be by themselves, hopeless victims, just waiting to be victimized by these these roving gangs of bad people that would coalesce the second government doesn't exist. That, that seems to be what people think. But and, and I th and I want to want to say that even if that is true and that did happen the thing that i think people are not recognizing is that there would be a, at least equal and opposite and i would say more than equal because innately humans aren't most humans aren't psychopathic evil people we're actually good compassionate people so when we see something terrible like that happening uh both for our own you know we need to save ourselves and our own family and for everyone else we would bind together to deal with that threat and by doing so, we would gain autonomy. So just like Kaczynski's thing, in a real setting like that, we set a goal, we eliminate those roving gangs. If we go through obstacles to, to find a way to do it, finally we achieve that goal. And in the end, we gain more freedom and autonomy as a result versus what we get now in our surrogate society where the government takes care of everything for us. If there's a gang they decide they have to take care of, well, we just sit back and watch them on TV. And they take care of it for us, steal our money, right? They steal our money and then they send these cops in there to do their thing. And then we're like, yay. Yeah. So we've lost, we've, we're just doing surrogate activities that are infantilizing us and taking away our freedom and autonomy versus like that, if we were living in the state of nature, we would still take care of that situation for sure. And then in the end, we would be stronger as a people and as individuals because of it.
I even like, I, see, I have this thing where I really like Eastern religions more than Western, or you could say I, I have a thing against the Abrahamic religions, which I don't find in the other religions. And what it is, is belief. The, the three Abrahamic religions have this requirement for you to believe in their God and the tenets of their religion for you to get into heaven and for you to be a, a, a them, to be a Muslim, to be a Christian, to be a um, Jew. You have to believe in their, uh, what's it called, uh, theology. Um, whereas, say, Buddhism, Buddhism encourages disbelief. Buddha said, don't believe me. Try the things I'm saying and see if they work for you. Uh, Buddhism is more psych. If you look into the writings of Buddhism and, and whatnot, it's much more psychological in nature than, say, the Abrahamic religions. They're all talking about these beings, these mythologized beings, which people today think are literal. And they're claiming in the Bible and the Quran that you have to believe in these beings for you to be able to get into heaven. And it's the main thing that you do in the religion. It's, it's, it's the whole purpose of it. Like 70% of the Quran is just believe, you must believe. And if you don't believe, what's going to, the word believe is like the main thing that Allah wants basically is you have to believe in him and, and the disbelievers this is what happens to them and like just gives parable after parable the one thing i liked about the quran is that it says like allah gives the following parable oh okay the bible does at least you <laughs> admit it's a parable. Yeah, at least you admit it almost every time when they're gonna say a parable in uh, the quran it says right uh, allah gives the following parable oh okay well then we, we don't have to get like bogged down in thinking that this is literal history right but then there's this other quote in the Quran that makes it just like all these scriptures do. It makes it um, makes you wonder. It makes it up to debate because it has this other quote that I'm. It's too long for me to <clears throat> get verbatim, but I'll paraphrase where it's like um, the Quran is full of many parables, uh, but many will say that uh, it is only metaphorical and there is no literal truth. It felt, it felt like it was talking to me. It's like oh. <laughs> and, and it's like. Uh, and those people will get bogged down in looking for what the hidden meanings uh, of the Quran really are. But Allah prefers those who, rather than trying to, you know, get bogged down in those hidden meanings, just goes along with the literal word. So again, paraphrasing, but that's the meaning of what this this passage said, and and it's like, okay, so on one hand, Allah's admitting that pretty much everything in the book is a parable, but then it's also got this little thing where it's like saying, yeah, pretty much everything's a parable, but it's written in such a way that the meanings are so hidden and open to interpretation that Allah would prefer it if you just literally follow what he's saying. <laughs> okay. So, so now what am I supposed to do? No, um, uh, what I wanted to say, though, is just that, so like these religions, they're the the three abrahamic religions it's like they're requiring from their adherents that you believe in them and that's the main thing that they want from you whereas in other religions jainism hinduism buddhism taoism that's not even talked about let less like the main focus like yeah. it's not it, they don't need you to believe in it they don't care if you believe in it they're they've they've got a, a language for talking about the divine and it's like like hinduism is so obviously metaphor that it's like do you really think they're talking about some <laughs> elephant headed guy and, and, and he's right. like <laughs> and they even like, say you know uh supreme personality of godhead lord krishna comma right. the self is the <laughs> self like it will say that verbatim right <laughs> You know, right there, they're telling you. But no, he has an elephant head and six arms. <laughs> but so they do that. It's like clearly otherworldly or other dimensionally. And when you write religious scripture, it's meant to be taken that way so that you can compare it to yourself in this dimension. 
it's like they purposely are trying to put you out of the norm so that you can you have to use your right brain you have to use metaphor you have to think about okay so how does this guy that's being swallowed by a fish for three days and then coming out a, a believer how does that translate to <laughs> meaning anything to me in 2023 reading about it and that's what you have to do in these scriptures if you're going to get anything out of them and if you don't all you get is thinking that that's a literal history and a literal history of a six arm guy with an elephant head it's going to make you you're going to be nuts now if, you, if that's what yeah. you think is literal history similarly to you know people who think that let's go with muhammad today since i'm on islam people who think muhammad flew on a winged horse named barak who took him to jerusalem and then flew him back within 24 hours like a santa claus flight and uh you know that's people because muhammad is supposedly not like the other deity figures because he admitted that he's just a regular human being and there's no miracles but meanwhile he flew on a flying horse to jerusalem he was the uh, he was in a cave apparently and angels appeared to him and started telling him to recite back to to them word for word what they said and he did it and they said now you write it down and uh so oh and then another time later on in muhammad's life some disbelievers were around and he's he prayed for the evening and then suddenly allegedly the moon that was just over a mountaintop split into two and went down both sides of the mountain and the people there converted to islam afterwards they believed that you know he was the prophet so with these you know those as there's three examples of supernatural things that your supposedly non-supernatural religion creator did now i've never had an angel appear to me and tell me to <laughs> recite things back to him so to me that's not something that i can believe in or to me i've never seen you know i've never prayed and then had a, the moon split into two i've never uh, seen a flying horse that could <laughs> take me to jerusalem but <laughs> but muslims have to believe this you have right. to allah says it over and over and over you have to believe you have to believe you have to believe and and, and if you disbelieve eternal hellfire you know and so you're getting gaslighted into having to believe these things that are completely against your experience. If you have no experiential knowledge in a thing, but you have a book or whatever claiming that you're going to burn in hell forever. One book, you, too. Yeah. Just one. No, <laughs> well, not, nothing contemporary. Yeah, no oh, one yeah. else around saw the moon split. No one. Yeah. Right. Uh, like... What are you doing? What does that mean to to believe? If you have no experiential knowledge of the thing and you're just being gaslighted into it or threatened into it or like love bombed into it, like if you do believe you get to go to the special happy place, you get to go to heaven forever. So it's the carrot on the stick method of control where they are giving you a threat on one end, which is eternal hellfire, and then giving you the bribe of eternal happiness. And what do I have to do? I just have to believe in some random stuff that I've never seen before. And it's 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 different random stuff depending on where you were born. It's like if you're born in the Middle East, you have to believe this guy flew on a horse. If you believe you know if you were born in America, you got to believe this guy levitated after death. <laughs> you know, yeah. Different different things you got to believe, but you have to believe that. And so, so what is what are you doing? I don't know if you can answer this in your experience, but like, what was I doing? I, I never, I don't think I ever did it because I was, I was, I grew up in a Christian household and I, I was a believer, but I, I never was because from the the longest time I remember, I was questioning, like from five years old, my earliest memories are five years old. From that time, I already remember questioning things about religion you know like jesus they, they tell me to pray to him but he doesn't answer so i had a question like what am i talking to what do you mean i'm talking to jesus and they have to tell me like well he you know 
there are there are convoluted explanations that they have for why he doesn't talk back to you. Right. <clears throat> and and forever they're on. But I mean, at least up until I was thirteen, I went to church and like, you know, I would listen and they would have you do that thing where it's like accept Jesus into your heart. Say after me, uh, Jesus is my savior or whatever. And then like after you do that, they're like, You're going to heaven now. I was like, well, and that felt good as a kid. Right. You, you got all these adults around you telling you to do this little this little thing. And uh, and then they're like, you're now going to go to heaven. And, and and you hear about atheists, you hear about hell and all this stuff. And it's like, it's basically a, a gaslighting, I guess is the right word, again, for it. You're, well, a torture is the other word, basically. You're, you're, you're granting people a special place that everyone else doesn't get to. And the only way you can get to this special place is to do this thing that doesn't make any sense. And that is to believe in something you've never experienced. And now you're special. Now you get to go to heaven forever. You'll never, you'll never burn in hell because you believe. But what is it? And I, and I can't answer it really for myself because I don't feel like I ever really did believe. I was always skeptical. As a kid, you know, as a kid, you don't, you're not good at, you don't, you're not good at knowledge yet. You have questions. You know, why, why, sure. why? And so I, I didn't know that I wasn't a Christian, or I didn't know anything like that. I didn't disbelieve it. I just was curious. But I'm, I'd like to ask the people that are true believers, and they absolutely believe. What does that mean to them? What is it? What do you feel that you are doing when you are believing in it? What what act have you done? What has changed in you? Like if that's the one requirement to go to to heaven, and and God is like looking down like Santa with a checklist, like what is the thing that puts you on the nice versus naughty list? How does he decide whether okay that's belief? Like did I believe it as a kid when I was skeptical the entire time and I had nothing but questions, but I said the thing I be- I I said it I said I believe in Jesus and I accept him into my heart. Was that enough? Because the pastor said that was enough. But okay, now time is gone. I'm 40. I have way more questions. I don't consider myself a Christian. Now do I go to heaven? Do I still get to go to heaven? I said the little phrase back when I was a kid. I said it multiple times because they would say like, hey, you can say it again. Even if you've said it before, say it again. So they do it regularly in church services. So I'd like to ask the believers, and if I could ask God, I'd love to ask God, what is this belief that you require, what is the act of belief? What are you doing? And how could you differentiate that from someone who doesn't do that? Like if I didn't open my mouth, how would any Christian know that I'm not a believer? Right, right, right. So what what are they doing? That is the only way. And it's so funny you say that because right, if you didn't open your mouth and say the thing, so so this worldly act shows my spirit you know, and, my <laughs> and my soul and what I believe. This worldly thing. I said some words. And so who I am and how I exist in this world, that has no, that doesn't matter. What it matters is belief. And that's a big debate in uh, religious circles. Cir- your paycheck too. <laughs> that's a debate in religious circles is, uh, they call it belief versus works. And they'll say so. Some people think you need to work to get into heaven, or you need to you need to do things to be a worthy person in God's eyes, whereas others say, no, you just have to believe, and that's enough. And so the, there's this ongoing debate that I don't know if it's ever going to end in the Abrahamic religions versus this, or like works versus belief. What does God want from us? Now, personally, I'm not going to say either way. But I would say between those two, and, and 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 when I've seen these debates, faith or whatever almost always wins. The people who say work, it's like apparently that's not scriptural and that's not to be backed up. But for me, I think like you just said, it's like, well, if you're not doing and being in the world in a way that anyone can see that you're a net positive, then... What, what good is you believing in God doing anything? Like, if you believe in God, but you beat your kids and drink, you know, <laughs> alcohol and 
whatever any various negative things. A lot of people things. say God drove them to do it. A lot of people <laughs> kill their kids and then say God told me to do it. He told me to suffocate her with a pillow. That's true. Okay. <laughs> and they believe that. A lot of yeah, them. and they might really believe that they were actually doing something good. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's crazy. So what? Man. So what is this thing that is that they call belief? And is it really that valuable? And is it more valuable than even works? like religious works, if you're going to do charity and do good things for people, you don't think God thinks that's a good thing? Like, like how, or, or even if you don't believe in God, like, it's inherently good. <laughs> like, like, good work is inherently good, but belief isn't inherently anything. So why, why is this belief over work philosophy so inherent, especially in Christianity? I think that it should be the complete opposite. I think the best Christians should be the ones who are the most compassionate and selfless and helping of the world like you know helping impoverished people because that's the other thing is like christians nowadays is that what they care about or do they just care about spreading the belief missionaries like if, if all you care about is getting more people to believe in your little supernatural mythological figure and that's all you care about we're back to the infantilization again all you want is to get yep. everybody to be infantilized so that they believe in things that they don't haven't even experienced, like little kids. That's and that's what they're doing. So yeah, and then you go in overseas and go in like that that kind of the missionary that got killed on that island. <laughs> Did you see that one? There's that island of um, t like 200 natives that have never even. Oh yeah, 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 yes, 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 yes. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and the only the only person crazy enough to try and go there is a Christian missionary. Who goes there a couple times he gets thrown spears at the first time and he's still too dumb to to stop so he comes back again with his bible and they kill him that was re that was like last year right a few years ago it's not really funny but it's like like i'm saying it's these, ironic they he's an agent of our own infantilization and these real people these real men are just like <laughs> get him <laughs> <laughs> And and so, um, but my I want to get back on that thing: works versus belief. It's like they're regardless of religion, work is definitely more important than belief. Belief is just some internal thing that has no bearing on anything in the world. But what you do, your work, has, is everything. It's who you are. So, and and if work is what's important, guess what? Religion isn't. And in your exclusive religion doesn't matter anymore. And I think that's why it's such a big deal to these Christians that belief over works. Because mm -hmm. if it's works over belief, then what about those hardworking Hindus and those hardworking Buddhists and those those truly compassionate Taoists, you know, and those truly selfless Jainists? Are they really not going to go to heaven? Are they really not deserving of the good things in life? Because your God said, oh, you just need to believe in me. And I think that's why the Abrahamic religions need so hard to cling to this belief thing, because it's all they have over the other ones. If if the few, you know, if the Westerners who are gaslighted by these three religions actually took the time to do like Acharya S did and do the comparative work, read all the religious books, compare and contrast, and it's mostly compare, because there's not much difference in them, uh, you'd find that all these, the unity, within them all and then realize that because they're so similar there's no way you can choose just one and be like oh this is the right one but you also don't necessarily need to throw them all out and be like well these are useless because they're not it's it's ancient wisdom that has been encoded into peril it's actually brilliant the problem is is that we've devolved into a type of humanity that can't even read these books anymore and understand what's being said and so we read them and we say this is what it means. And then everyone else parrots it and like, this is what it means until everyone thinks so. And then when someone like us reads it and I'm like, that's not what this says. This, to, I mean, <laughs> when I read it, here's what this says to me. The good twin, the bad twin. Oh, the good twin does this, the bad twin. To me, this says, this is a parable that never actually happened, but it's outlaying a whole bunch of different positive things that you could do in your life and a whole bunch of negative things that other people do in their life. And it's showing you uh, the consequences and you know that's what um you ever heard of devotionals that's what um, they call bible stories for children and they take the same bible stories but they they childrenize them and then 
elucidate the moral, in, or they actually articulate it afterwards for the kid, uh, for the child. Sorry, those of you who keep telling me I say kid too often. <laughs> um, <laughs> words have meaning, Eric. A kid is a baby goat. Yeah. You're bringing it into existence when you say the word. I'm just talking. Holier than thou. Exactly. I feel like uh, I, I get it. Yeah, I'll say child sometimes right, right. And, and children or whatever. But when people like 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 I can't even talk anymore because uh, yeah, whatever. Yeah, I've, and I've lost my train of thought. You made me lose my train of thought because of that. You people in the comments. Uh, see, so why can't I just say kid? <laughs> I'm, I'm on a roll. I'm talking, and then because of, because of your stupid comment, you now I now I can't back on my train of thought. <laughs> you were talking about uh, the Bible, kids book devotionals. Thank you, thank you. So, kids so, book, <laughs> yeah, kids book. But I, what I liked about the devotionals is that they're admitting that these these parables have deeper meanings when you admit that they're just analogies and then you try to figure out how can this have meaning to my life in the present time and that's what the devotionals did and it's like why do the people reading the bible think that the people who wrote it meant it as anything but a devotional it's not history you know jacob and he like that that i come on <laughs> you yeah. really think that these people existed like you can prove they didn't, and that's why everyone who's who's you know rolling their eyes at me right now, read Acharya S. This woman we're talking yep. about, you will you know if you actually did, you won't, you won't. You'll just go back and you read your Bible. You know, oh, I just need to believe, right? Okay, I'm just gonna believe harder. And if I read Acharya S., that's gonna make me not want to believe, and maybe I'll go to hell. No, it was put there by the devil to deceive you, of course, and make you lose your belief. Mm. That's what she did. Yeah. <laughs> And all those religions that were similar to Christianity before Christian, uh, the devil brought those to the world beforehand because he knew that Jesus was going to come. I've gotten that one over and over again. Yep, so he's going to test that, us. They actually believe that. So you, you, your thinking gets pretty skewed when you when belief over everything else. And that's what happens when you, you become a religious thinker. There's a, a line that says something like, Jesus was not God's son because God does not have a, because Allah does not have a consort, therefore cannot have a son. <laughs> I thought that was funny in the Quran. <laughs> and so, so Muslims don't believe that Jesus is God's son, but they believe that he was a legitimate prophet of God and that Muhammad was the, the last prophet and the most legitimate. It's a great talking point for them, for sure, right. for everyone involved. <laughs> right. And it gets them so that they can like, it's like, oh, we can level with So Muslims, they're able to like level with everybody else, but then they have their extra thing. It's like, well, we believe, we believe your guy too. It's just like, we got this extra stuff. We got the extra, right, 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 right. Extra That's what I mean. That you don't a good have. selling point. Right. So, so you got these three religions that all have, they basically have a, um, unending um, dictate within their own books telling them that they can never stop being at war <laughs> because this is the whole thing is you had to convert everybody to believe in your version of scr scriptural reality and so you have to so actually now that I'm saying that what's the what's the um, what's the inevitable end result a new world order right so if you create this these abrahamic religions that just fight against each other forever eventually one has to win out yep that, there you go and then you got your one world religion whichever one wins and, it, and if it was controlled opposition to begin with like i say and it was created by the people who i can't talk about who <laughs> you know, been banned from everywhere for talking about yep. Uh, and and everyone knows are in charge of the banks and the media and the government and everything. Well, I'm not gonna say who it is, right? But we all know who I'm talking about, right? And it's the the first religion that, that they piggybacked on for Christianity and then and then Islam, right? So I'm just gonna stop talking now because we're just, <laughs> I don't know what to say. It's just, I've, I've talked myself I, I, into a corner now, and I feel no, like no, I have no, all no. the evidence to, to. It's like yeah, it's exactly what I'm saying, yeah. and now I can't go any further because if I do. This video gets taken down. <laughs> yep. Now you got to police your language a little bit. You can say kid all you want. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, dude, it's like a multi-layered thing, too, with all three of them. You know, not only does it take power away from, like, the misinterpretation of it as a belief in an outside thing instead of taking it for the parable and metaphors that it are, which is about you, you know, it takes the power from, which it should be giving all the power to the individual reading that. And instead, because it makes you realize that you're, you're the divine one, you know, instead, it's completely usurped and you you lose that and you put it off in someone else so you lose the power in the individual that way it's another form of almost like uh just anything that has to do with identity politics you know that's taking away from you and grouping into it's it's taking power away from you now you're part of a group you're not just you with what what you do you believe in the same thing that all these other people believe in and it reminds me of the past uh, three years, pretty much, even just an ancient version, almost like Hegelian dialect, almost problem, devil, you might go to hell reaction. Oh, no. How do I not go to hell and how do I get to heaven solution? We got you. Just come <laughs> believe in our thing and we'll take care of you. We'll make sure you get there, even right. though you can't see it. There's no evidence of it. It's intangible. Every, all the evidence is actually to the contrary of it. Just believe us and we'll take care of you. Mm-hmm. And like the, and the first group who shall not be named, they didn't even need to necessarily believe because their originators told them that just by virtue of their birth, they were God's chosen people. And so they don't even need to believe it. They're just, but they do. They believe that they're God's chosen people. Yep. And then from there, next Christians come along and they're like, no, we're God's chosen people. And so then the original chosen people are like, well, no, you're not. We are. How are you going to prove that that you are? And they're like, believe, <laughs> because we believe we are. And they're like, whoa, just like just like we believe we are? I'm like, yeah, just like that. <laughs> and then the Muslims come along and they're like, we can do it too. <laughs> yep. Sand belief. <laughs> yep. it's, it's, it's all the same thing. Like, what... What is the advantage here? What have we gained? From what? From uh, belief. Be believing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Nothing. You lose it all, dude. You lose all your power and yourself and everything. Believing in anything is other than uh, yourself, right? Like right, you said, right. if it if the whole thing doesn't point to you and and what you can do for yourself, what good is belief? And what is it? Is my big question. It's like I don't even get what belief is, other than some disempowering. It's not even a real thing, like government. It's like, like an idea. Like what? Uh, like you believe in th things you know. Like like I, I like I stopped using the word belief and I use the word know instead because it's the only word that makes sense to me. But, but if I use the word belief by accident, <laughs> I'm I'm using it to talk about something that that I know <laughs> because there's evidence for it. You know, like uh, or, or maybe the, it's like um. So, like, I believe I'll wake up in the morning tomorrow, but you might not because there's a slight chance that you won't, those kind of things. But even that, at least that's based on, like, 99.999% right, right. evidence yep. of things that Anecdotal, has always happened personal. to me. Whereas this, this type of belief that they're trying to engender in me, where I blindly believe in something I've never experienced, or I've never even experienced anything like it. Like, everything you ascribe to Jesus is just totally not what normal people can do or see or experience in their life so you're trying to get me to give truth what do you call it give truth give a truth verdict to something i have zero evidence for and for me to hold fast to it in my being and call it truth and and for me to to think that that is somehow a, an amazing quality for a human being to have to be able to do this thing which actually anyone could do like I, said, I was brainwashed to do it as a kid like it's it's simple you just tell a kid hey jesus is real if you believe in him you go to heaven if you don't you're gonna burn in hell forever okay so i say after me i be i believe in jesus and i accept him and i accept him in my heart like <laughs> it works it works to to get people to do what you want if that's if that's the point. <laughs> but if Fear, the point man. is you're right. But if the point is actually knowing what you can know and having truth as your foundation, 
you can't believe in any of these religions. You can read the books and you can you can you can question. Hey, I wonder if any of this ever actually happened in in real life. But you can't believe it did or know it did. But the thing you can get out of the scriptures is the parables, and that's what people should be getting. Like if you're gonna read the book, read what you can get out of it and how it can change your life. How can you become a better person from it? Not how can I go to heaven if I believe it and not go to hell? And I think that's what most people. That's how, and that's why the Bible and religion doesn't have much value in today's society, because that's how it's being treated. It's being treated as just this thing that, boom, like there's like what two billion Christians or something. What does that even mean? That means two billion people made a snap decision and they said, "I believe." Congratulations, Christians! Amazing. You're gonna change the world. That like, we're back to the works thing. Like, now do something. Okay, yeah. I'll be a missionary in Timbuktu. No, do something real. No, don't just spread your belief, your belief in some mythological character. No, do something that helps the world. And I'm, of course, many Christians do. Actually, Christians are great at that. To be honest, they do soup kitchens and, and a lot of stuff. But not the beliefs ones. Not these ones that are debating endlessly about how belief is all we need and and works is works is meaningless. Work is everything. Um, as far as you know, who you are. It's it goes from what you think to what you say to what you do. It's like gas, liquid, solid. We crystallize who we are by allowing ourselves to think certain certain things. You know, because meditation allows you to shut out certain things. If you don't want to think certain things, if you have certain evil or whatever thoughts creeping in, you do have the ability to stop. You know. Or, or you have the ability to ruminate on those evil things or, or whatever, like psychopaths would do. And so as a compassionate person trying to be a, a, a good person in the world, well, first thing is you monitor your thoughts. You do that through meditation. Okay, next up, speaking. You don't just... You don't just let whatever evil or random thoughts might... Because the best person in the world will still have an evil thought crop, crop because evil exists. Sure. So yeah. these thoughts are going to happen. And if you don't filter it through your mouth to say it in a way that is genuine and truthful and, and uh, real to you, well, now you're just lying or you're, you're, you're crystallizing something into reality that's fake. And then work is the third part, you know, like I said, think, speak, do, and that's works. So you, what you do, that's who you are fundamentally, like the most. You know, what you think, okay, what you say, well, what you do, I mean, what, what you believe. So the, <laughs> that's what Chris, so, so you, like I'm saying, it's like gas to liquid to solid. That's how you crystallize who you are in this world. Totally. It goes from your thoughts to your, to your uh, speech, to your actions. But Christians would say, yes, and then there's a fourth one. And after that is belief. And that's the ultimate thing you could do. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what you do. You just have to believe. Yep. Again, what? takes power away from the individual, puts all the responsibility on something else. You can be forgiven for your sins. Don't worry. All you got to do is believe. Mm -hmm. 10% of that check again, too. You know? Right. This may be the only secular podcast that has ever talked about faith versus works <laughs> but i think that's funny because uh as a uh agnostic i think works are all important and faith doesn't matter at all totally man for sure <laughs>